Okay, so welcome to day two. Right, okay, sorry about that. So, what we tried to do yesterday was uh, provide you with an introduction to embedded systems. Uh, we talked about what a super loop was, what 8051 uh, microcontroller is. Uh, we talked about some of the simplest software architectures for We talked about some of the simplest software architectures for embedded systems, began to look at some coding guidelines, and began to look at some techniques which are needed to meet real-time constraints in the systems that we build. Uh, so what we're going to do today, yesterday was really the introduction. So yesterday we covered some of the key features of the C language that you need to know when creating embedded systems. We, create, we looked at the simplest possible software architecture, which is essentially something like that. What's wrong with that? We talked yesterday about uh, we began to talk about real-time systems. What's wrong with that in the context of a real-time system? There is no operating system. Um, so what? So there's no operating system to return to, but in reality, that's all I care about. Uh, in this case, I've got two, two functions, two tasks. Uh, if it's a real-time system, what am I likely to want to know about those tasks? Start, yeah. time. start times. So I want to control the start times, uh, maybe the interval between the tasks. I certainly want to know how long after it starts it finishes, etc. The problem with this is that it doesn't give me uh, that level of control over these kinds of systems. So we talked about some of the ways in which you can We talked about some of the ways in which you can perhaps put a sandwich delay around these tasks, so take a little bit more control. Uh, we talked about some of the possible ways in which you might want to balance the execution time of these tasks, so they always had a fixed uh, duration more generally. But that may not be enough. It's not a terribly robust way of building the systems. Suppose we want to set something up that has a delay of a couple of seconds between the task executions there. What's another problem with that? Suppose that takes about 10 milliseconds, that takes about 20 milliseconds. And that delay is about two seconds. What system is not doing anything for that period. System's not doing anything. Power consumption is probably high over that period, given the architects we've looked at so far. System's probably running on full power and over that period, and we're not really getting very much that's very useful out of it. There must be better ways of building the system that give us control over the power consumption, but particularly control over the timing behavior. And that's what we're going to look at today. So. Overall, Superloop is very easy to understand. Uh, it's got minimal resource requirements. It's difficult to imagine a system, an architecture for an embedded application, which has lower resource requirements than a Superloop. Uh, and it's suitable for what are sometimes called soft real-time systems. Uh, 
you want to build a simple central heating system or whatever else, you can build it using that kind of approach. You just need a small assembly language startup file and a very small amount of C code. It's difficult to run execution, to run tasks with a known period, periodic tasks that have to run at a known interval, and it's not suitable for real-time systems. Uh, many applications require precise control over tasks. Generating sound from stored samples, a simple MP3 player. Uh, you've got to have control over the timing of those tasks. What happens if there's variation? You get distortion. Um, if you're sampling a sound and you're using, let's say, a 16-bit analog to digital converter, and you get variations, you get jitter in the sampling time. What, what's the first impact? What's, what's the impact like in a sample data system if you do that? So if we don't manage to run the task precisely with zero jitter, so no variation, so they run exactly, let's say, one microsecond apart is what our goal is. And there's, uh, we have no variation there, everything's fine. But if we get a little bit of variation, what's the impact on the way that the sampling works? It's not right. Uh, we started off explicitly, we start with a 16-bit ADC. Uh, the first impact, as we get a little bit of variation, is that it's effectively a 15-bit ADC. A little bit more variation, it's 14-bit, 13-bit, so on. We gradually degrade the quality of the signal. We, get a great, we, get, we reduce the signal-to-noise ratio in the system quite quickly. And by the time you get to something like in a sample data system for the inputs or the outputs, if it's a control system, the outputs as well, if you get more than about 10% of jitter in the signals, it's, the system will generally simply not work properly at all. You'll have so much uh, distortion that it simply won't work effectively. How does the bit count uh, Effectively, what you're doing is... Wait, uh, uh, wait until Thursday, and I'll give you an answer to that. With uh, on Thursday, we, we can run through exactly where the jitter comes from and the impact of that, and I can give you the maths as well if you want it. Uh, for now, our key requirement is to try and get these values as close as we can to the uh, to the real value. So these are some of the things: speech playback, data acquisition, control. Um, various things that require periodic signals. We can try and adjust our super loop to achieve this, as we just outlined. We can start sticking in a simple delay, etc. But that's not going to work particularly well for us. If there's any variation in this task duration, uh, then uh, we're not going to get periodic activity here at all. So what's our solution? Uh, we need some form of slightly more sophisticated architecture or operating system for our applications. Uh, and we're going to approach this today by looking at what is probably the simplest practical way of assembling an embedded system where you have real-time constraints, which is virtually everyone that's of interest. So we're going to work Initially, we're going to look at how you can create what can be called a simple embedded operating system. To start with, what today is really about is beginning to use interrupts in your program. Um, this is the Webopedia computer dictionary. Um, a signal informing a program that an event has occurred. When a program receives an interrupt signal, it takes a specified action. Interrupt signals can cause a program to suspend itself temporarily to service the interrupt. From a programmer's perspective, interrupts are a way of having the hardware call functions in your system. It's one way of viewing what's uh, uh, going on in the design. Many embedded systems are built by having a number of different interrupt sources which uh, a respond, for example, to, to data coming in over a serial interface, over your CAN bus, uh, completion of an analog to digital conversion. All of these generate interrupts. Those, in turn, trigger functions in your code, which are called interrupt service routines. 
and they uh, deal with the event or with the data uh, that corresponds to that event. And that's how many systems are built. What we're going to focus on is what are called time-triggered systems. Uh, in a time-triggered system, we have one interrupt service routine, which is linked to a timer. Uh, typically, in the simplest systems, and the systems we're going to look at this week, the interrupts are all related to periodic timer overflows. So what our systems are going to look like for much of this week This is how we typically think of an embedded system. So this is time. This interval is typically about one millisecond. Uh, and and so on. These are the tasks we're going to run in our system. So we're going to have functions which are called periodically. So these represent the interrupt events in our system. These represent the function calls that correspond to those. That's how we're going to build the systems that we're looking at uh, today. Let's start with, let's just start with that and just think about this for a minute. Uh, if that's going to work correctly, what do I need to know about A and B? Duration. So I need to know the duration more specifically. Execution time. Um, yep, and more specifically. Okay, so worst case execution time is what I'm looking for. So I need to know WCET. Uh, I need to know the worst case execution time of every task in the system because in this kind of design, we'll talk about the error handling mechanisms uh, in due course, but the basic rule is that in these kind of systems, we're going to need to ensure that we know the worst case execution time and the worst case execution time is less than the interval between ticks. It's not always one millisecond. Many designs, many aerospace designs, for example, be about 25 milliseconds. But it's typically a fixed uh, interval. We'll look at some variations on that as well. It's typically a fixed interval uh, right the way through the system execution. And we need to know the execution time of the tasks in the system to ensure that um, we're never going to have a situation where the combination of tasks that are running in a particular tick uh, are going to exceed the available tick interval. So this is what the system then looks like. So we have our system ticks. And in this case, we're calling what we call here an update function. So we have our one millisecond timer link to an interrupt, and we'll see how to do that in a moment. That's uh, triggering our timer ISR, timer interrupt service routine, which in this case is called update. Uh, and we'll have a set of, fa of tasks um, called from this update function. And typically, this will be linked into a long switch statement in the C code. We'll look at some ways of creating such uh, statements shortly. The rest of the time, this is the while one loop in the system. We still have main looking pretty much the same as before. So we have our main function doing some initialization and then going into a while one loop. The difference in this case is that the while one loop just puts the processor to sleep. So when it's not executing these tasks, the processor goes into idle mode stays in idle mode until the next interrupt occurs, wakes up and does that processing. So if there's a long gap here, the power consumption uh, will be reduced in the system because the system is going to spend most of its time in a lower power idle mode. 
This is the first example we're going to look at of, a, of what's called a time-triggered system with cooperative tasks. The tasks are cooperative in that once task A has started running, it uh, finishes when it finishes, when it chooses to finish. So it's basically the operating system here doesn't have a direct way in this architecture of interrupting task A. So task A, the phrase that's usually used is it runs until completion, runs to completion in these designs. So if you wanted to make somebody's system fail, what's the simplest thing you could do? Increase the execution time. Increase the execution time in the worst case scenario is that. Uh, in effect, so if it's a cooperative system, then the worst case scenario is that the tasks don't complete. And we looked at some of the techniques for dealing with that scenario yesterday, but that's a worst case failure mode for these systems. And we'll look at solutions and ways in which you can deal with that over the course of the next few days. So that's our basic architecture. Uh, and you can start assembling uh, quite sophisticated systems quite quickly even based on this simple architecture. This is the basic uh, structure of a washing machine, which we'll look at in slightly more detail a little bit later on, where we've got various inputs coming from switches, level sensors, etc., and we're controlling various components in the design. And the system will actually consist of a single timer ISR, storing a single set of states for this system, and the coding task will be to determine the activity that's performed in each state uh, and the transition processes between states in this system. So, to create this, we need, uh, need to be able to set up a timer ISR, need to be able to set up a timer that's triggered periodically, and we use the code placed in the corresponding interrupt service routine to run the code in our system. Uh, any high-level language or any compiler or development tool set for a high-level language that's intended for use in embedded systems makes it easy to hook interrupts to particular uh, service routines or functions. So this is probably the most significant code example today. This is our complete uh, operating system. Complete operating system for this uh, application and for the 8051 microcontroller. So our main function uh, is as short as this. We're setting up a timer. This time, so the timer, set, timer initialization code is not on here. The timer initialization code is almost identical to the timer delay code that we looked at yesterday. So setting up a, a one millisecond timer tick is almost the same as setting up a one millisecond timer delay. We'll look at the differences in a moment. In this case, yesterday we disabled interrupts when we created the delay function. This time we enable interrupts. We simply go into an empty super loop. Uh, and we do nothing here. We're not even putting the processor to sleep, primarily so that I can fit all of this on one page. Uh, and then we've got our function X, which is linked to the timer uh, to overflow interrupt in this system. There's nothing magical about that, and there's nothing magical about the way the interrupt is hooked up here. It just happens to be the way that this is done in the Kyle compiler. Different compilers have different ways of making that link. You had a question. Yeah. If we're going into an empty super loop, how, do we, how does the interrupt actually break that and do something? Is, is it due to the interrupt keyword? Or is it, it well, it's just the same way. So um, when we looked at the examples here, we said, OK, the process is going to be asleep at this point. Provided nothing has gone wrong, the processor will be asleep. The interrupt will wake it up and will we'll, uh, process the interrupt. Exactly the same thing happens here. 
we could change that while loop. That while one loop could be doing, um, could be like that. So I could be carrying out some, some useful activity in here. And if I was, then whatever I was doing in there would still be interrupted when the interrupt was generated every millisecond. So it's not, so the processor is not asleep, it just happens to be doing whatever uh, machine code instructions have been generated by the compiler to interpret um, that while one statement in C. Uh, and that, those instructions are interpreted. In this case, if the processor is asleep when we do this, we may get slightly less jitter because it depends on the particular environment we're working in. So even in here, even in that very simple loop, there may be, uh, it'll be translated into a stream of instructions uh, in the executable code. Those instructions may not all have the same length. Each of those instructions will have, whichever instruction is currently running at the instant the interrupt is generated will need to complete before the interrupt can be serviced. And you have the potential for a small level of jitter, even in this system, uh, when uh, putting this code together. So you, by putting it into sleep mode, into an idle mode, you will reduce that jitter level further, and you'll have greater control over that. But um, by the time we get to Thursday, we'll look at some ways in which we um, have architectures which are similar to this one. So that we're doing some processing and simultaneously doing uh, other interrupts. At the same. Well, that is a situation, if you set it up in that way, it's a situation known as task preemption. Yeah. So that's the complete framework. Uh, now the question is, how do we start to uh, make use of it? That's how the timer is set up. The timer code is the same as yesterday. Uh, this time, it's though, we are uh, setting up the timer to interrupt. So that will generate an interrupt on the res in response to the timer overflow. The settings here are essentially the same. I'll say one talk about one difference in a moment. Uh, and then we start the timer running at the bottom here. There's one slight difference here in the way this is set up compared with yesterday. This is an automatically reloaded timer. And that's a key uh, requirement for these systems. So when the timer generates an interrupt, it automatically reloads itself and generates another interrupt uh, as far as close as possible to, in this case, whatever it is, one millisecond later. It's close as possible to one millisecond later, depending on the uh, stability of the oscillator and everything else in the system. It does that without, so you just have to set the timer up once and it generates this stream of periodic interrupts. Not all timers have an auto reload capability and in some timers you would have to manually reload the timer. When the interrupt is generated, you'd have to start the timer ISR in here probably the first thing you would do is reload the timer to generate the next interrupt. As you can imagine, that's fiddly because you need to take into account the time taken to service, the ISR, etc. You'd need to make sure that you weren't actually, um, that you were getting proper periodic interrupts in the system. Your ideal is to use an automatically reloaded timer as, in, as is the case here. So we then take this one step further uh, and turn this into something that uh, is a little bit closer to an operating system. So we make a couple of small changes uh, to put the processor to sleep between tasks to conserve power and reduce task jitter. And we end up with this version. Uh, so this is our uh, timer ISR in the version of the operating system that we'll use uh, in the course of today. So this is triggered periodically by the timer overflows. 
and to add tasks to this schedule, which is what the process is often called, you stick some function calls in here in the program code. If it's automatic reload, why are we manually setting We still, in, it just it depends on the particular compiler and the hardware combination. In this case, we have to manually reset the timer flag. The timing values are reloaded, but the flag must be manually set um, in code in this system. Is this a good, take a step back from this approach. I'm calling this a simple embedded operating system. And I'm saying, this is your operating system code, part of it. I'm saying, to run some tasks, so you'd edit this code by putting do x, do y, do z, etc. in here to call those particular tasks. And you might have a switch statement in here or some if-then statements that said, if 300 ticks have elapsed, call task A. Uh, if 400 ticks have elapsed, call task B, etc. You'd put all of that in here. Is that a good idea? Provided the worst case execution time is less than time. Okay. So let's assume we've got the worst case execution time sorted out. In software design terms, do you like this structure? Do you like this approach? Let me lead the witnesses. What's wrong with this? Is it the actual source code? No. Nope. Happy with that so far? Here's my ideal model of reliable software development. Somebody writes the tasks. Here's my OS. The OS is behind a barbed wire fence and nobody can touch it. That makes me happy. Because essentially there are bits in here, what I really don't want to happen is I don't want that changing that, for example. Uh, I don't want uh, this to be able to delete the task list or to make other changes to the way that this operates. This is a good starting point for an architecture for these systems. But I generally wouldn't want to fly it. Because here, I've got to, if you're going to use this, it's called simple for a reason. If you're going to use this in practice, um, let's say there are 50 or 100 tasks in the system, and there are a lot of people developing in the system in your organization. Uh, all of those people need access to the, uh, essentially all of the code for the operating system. And that doesn't make me comfortable. They're putting the tasks, so you're effectively editing the operating system every time you want to change or create your application. So the Overall software architecture with the periodic ticks and the way we're setting this up, that's good. Generally, it's very predictable. But we'll look at some ways in which you can avoid this problem with this kind of simple approach when we start looking at a slightly more sophisticated version tomorrow. So this is not the end of the story with this. Uh, it's a good starting point, but it's, it's not the end of how you'd want to finish this off. So this 
is how this version of the OS actually works. Uh, what we're doing here is what? So we get so in this case we're depending on the information. Okay. You're taking to the so we're taking the information, so we're initializing the timers here and we're using information that we have and we included yesterday in the main.h file, so in the project header file, and we're using this to automatically configure the timers to give us the required tick interval in the system. So yesterday we just used the information in main.h just as a documentation aid. Now we're trying to slightly more tightly pull together the design so the information from main.h uh, in our system will be used to automatically configure how the system ticks operate. Uh, that can be an effective solution. One of the challenges with a simple processor like this is um, it's quite complicated sometimes getting precise control of the tick time. It's not very flexible. Um, this is tends to be much better in a more modern processor, the kind of thing that we'll look at tomorrow. Uh, in a more modern 32-bit design, in here, the maximum tick interval you can get, for example, is 65 milliseconds. In a modern design, you can have tick intervals of 200 plus years, or 200,000 years, or something staggering, uh, at very, very fine levels of resolution. So it's um, significantly more flexible. You can't here, for example, have a one-second tick which sometimes would be quite useful because you can't automatically create that. So that's our basic structure of uh, the timer setup. Uh, we put the processor into sleep by setting the value in the power control register. Uh, and that's a simple way of entering idle mode in this particular processor. And again, it's processor specific. If you were working with a more complicated architecture, the kind of thing you're, you're putting the processor to sleep would probably be a more complicated process. Uh, you may need to take control of how different peripherals on the processor, they can have their own power down mode. So sometimes you have independent control over the processor itself and the, and the set of peripherals that are around the processor, and you might need to include ways of powering down those peripherals as part of putting these systems together. I think I've said most of this. So essentially, we can schedule a single um, C function, or we can put a switch statement, etc., in the heart of our update function. We control the tick interval. We've got up to 65 millisecond ticks. Um, and we'll talk about the use of different oscillator frequencies on the 8051. Um, if you want to do serial communications over standard baud rates on an 8051 processor, you have to use a crystal frequency, something like 11.0592 megahertz uh, to get the right baud rates, to get you, for example, 9600 baud, which is a standard baud rate. That's a bit fiddly uh, then as the basis for generating precise one millisecond ticks on the system. So there's a bit of a compromise there, and these compromises don't happen with more modern processors. So that's what the system is going to look like, which we've talked about. One of the tasks then go to idle mode. You can make this work in just about any embedded uh, processor. Uh, and as we'll look at tomorrow, you can make this run quite happily even on an embedded uh, PC platform. Um, you can run this kind of architecture. Um, in the code examples, you'll see we've used timer 2 for the timer settings in this because that is the automatically re reloaded timer. Timer 0 and timer 1 could be used in this design, but they're not automatically reloaded. We tend to, in the examples you'll see, we'll tend to use timer 0 and timer 1 to do hardware delays and other types of features within the system and reserve timer 2 for the operating system. Uh, formally, timer 2 doesn't exist in the 8051 architecture.
Timer 2 was actually added later on in what's strictly the 8052 architecture, but everyone now calls the whole of this extended large family of devices 8051s. If you try and use the standard, if you're working with the um, simulator and you select a generic 8051 as your target platform, you'll probably find that your scheduler doesn't work because it doesn't implement timer two behavior. So use, choose an 8052 generic platform or your timing behavior may not be quite what you expect. So uh, notes then run through uh, an example of how we can uh, make, uh, put together a slightly more representative system here. You can work out what the average uh, current consumption will be um, based on these designs once you know what percentage, once you know the worst case execution time and how long the processor will be in idle mode as long as you know the current consumption in each of those modes which you can get from the data sheet. Uh, and this is our uh, complete example. We do some initialization code in the system we set the timer up for 60 millisecond ticks and we put the processor into idle mode uh, between ticks. Uh, we have some initialization that would be associated with the task, for example, preparing uh, some of the ports for input or output, etc. And we have um, the uh, task that's called from the interrupt service routine in the operator system. That's a simple link between the operating system and the task that we're going to call here. What you need to then do is work out how you're going to create sets of tasks which have controlled execution time uh, and if you haven't we sent you a set of download details for a PTTS book um, that's got about um, 70 different code components and examples that cover some of the techniques you can use uh, we'll say more about the scheduler that's used in there tomorrow but the code examples and things such as the switch code, the code for LCDs, the code for ADCs, and the UART, etc., the code examples that are in there uh, and on the website uh, will also work quite happily with the architectures we're using today. Let's just look at one of those examples. I'll take you to this page first. How long is, give me a, a rough estimate, just a very rough estimate for the execution time of this task. Think back to yesterday, what was the approximate worst case execution time of a switch reading task? Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, that kind of order, yeah. Yeah, okay, so we set the debounce period at 50 milliseconds, so a typical switch read task would have a duration of um, 50 milliseconds plus. What about this? So give me a ballpark estimate the worst case execution time. It's probably not going to be a millisecond, is it? Even if this is running like treacle, 
uh, on a 4-bit processor you designed yourself in one of the later modules, this is going to not take a millisecond to run. Uh, it's going to be very, very short. There's nothing in here. What we do is we check whether a switch is pressed. If it is, increment a variable. Um, check against the uh, duration. So basically what we're saying is, well, how does it work? What does it do? Some kind of threshold, yeah. Yes, if it's past that, then uh, you set the duration to that, uh, and then you return it back. Well, you don't return it. You just say that the switch press G somewhere in the global area yep. is now it's pressed, and then you return. Yep. Um, so if it's not, then you just you just well, you say it's not. You make sure that they know it's not, and then you return. But you reset the duration anyway, so you do win that one. Um, and if, if it's not pressed, you say the duration is zero. So yesterday what we did was we typically said something like, is the switch pressed? Yup, it's pressed. Let's wait for about 20 milliseconds just to be sure that it stopped bouncing. Is it still pressed? Yup. Okay, return the value that says the switch is pressed. Or, uh, and that was our typical behavior. This time, because we can run the task periodically, we don't need to do that. All we do because we've got the ability to run tasks periodically, we check whether it's pressed, and then we say, okay, the debounce period is, let's say, 20 milliseconds. So we're going to come back 20 milliseconds later, and we're going to double check and see whether it's pressed. But we don't need to hang around and wait in that interval. We check, we go away and do something else, possibly run another 100 tasks, then we come back and check again. And the behavior, as far as the user is concerned, is exactly the same. The power consumption uh, is almost certainly reduced, and the system is able to multitask, in effect. It's not sitting there hogging the CPU, just burning up CPU cycles. Instead, it's able to do these things, um, uh, do one task, then go away and do something else, and come back and check again. This is significant because this is the way you need to start thinking about the system design in these kinds of applications. Uh, I'd argue the code is not illogical. We've not tried to, the code has not been um, made into some complicated form to fit the software architecture. Once you've built a system using this kind of approach a couple of times, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, and you start looking at the way you would uh, make this operate and work on the basis that the task duration should generally be pretty short. Uh, and if you find yourself in these kind of systems putting long delays in, hardware delays, etc., it's almost certain that something is wrong uh, with the way you're putting the system together. Because a delay probably means you should just be returning and coming back a certain amount of time later uh, in these kinds of designs. So generally, the tasks will be short. If you have a look at the uh, PTTS book, you'll find lots of other examples of ways in which we can put these kinds of systems together. Uh, we'll look at a couple of examples over the course of the rest of this session as well. So let's pull this together into uh, one slightly more representative example. We're going to put together a system to monitor uh, flow rates of milk through a pasteurization system. Uh, if the uh, flow rate falls below a particular threshold, um, we are going to sound a particular alarm here. And we're going to have a bar graph in here that's going to give us a representation of the flow rate. So we're going to start with our port.h file, exactly the same as yesterday, which lists all of the, basic, all of the various uh, port links. We're using an 8-bit 
bar graph here to represent the flow rate. We could just say use port 1 for the bar graph. But we don't do that. And the reason for that is quite often on any of these systems the ports will have multiple functions. And you might need three pins in the middle of port 1 to have a serial interface or something else like that. And often it's much more useful if you can set it up so that individual port pins are used and then if necessary these could be pins spread all over the processor as far as the software is concerned um, but then connected up appropriately uh, at the hardware level. So this is deliberately done so that we're using individual pins for each LED on the bar graph so that we have more flexibility in the way the system might be used ultimately. Uh, this is what our main loop looks like. Key things from this. You should be able to tell from main. It should, to a large extent, be pretty well self-documenting. Uh, I know there's something to do with pulse counts. I know there's something to do with a bar graph in this. Uh, I know the tick interval is 30 milliseconds, and that's what this system does. And that should, and main shouldn't have anything much more in it. Typically, you might have a large number of initialization functions, but essentially, you'd hope to be able to tell quite a lot from just looking at main what the system actually does for us. We set up our timer ISR, and we're just calling one of these functions from here in this particular case. The pulse count update function is called from the timer ISR within the uh, operating system. Um, this is the pulse count code. Uh, this is a link to, th this is how we link the different tasks within the system. So the underscore G postfix, the underscore G at the end of the variable names uh, are used to indicate these are global variables in the system. If it's extern, is it a declaration or a definition? So extern stands for external. So in this case, all we're telling the compiler is, it, is to public? Um, well it's, what it's saying is somewhere else in this system there is a variable called uh, uh, data g which is of type t bar graph and we'll look what that is in a moment uh, but that's what it's saying so it's not saying create a variable of this type it's saying there is one and it exists somewhere. So the compiler takes that on trust and compiles the code on that basis. The linker, if you didn't, you could stick together several files in your system, several modules in your system that all said that. They would all compile quite happily, but somewhere that variable has to be defined. So you have to allocate memory for it somewhere. And it, you'll get a linker error if you haven't done so. The compiler will compile it quite happily, but the linker will come back and say, I can't link this together because nowhere in this set of modules have you actually defined that variable. The key thing, though, for as far as we're concerned, is we use these uh, global variables to transfer data between the different modules in the system. Let's go back one more chunk this. Why is it safe to use global variables in that kind of system? What would, what would make it unsafe?
Suppose A and B are sharing or communicating via a global variable. Why is that safe? Because one runs before the other and one, so the challenge would be, the complication with global variables would be, suppose you had an array of 100 elements. And suppose you had a situation where task A could be running and writing to that array, and then task A could be interrupted by task B, and then task A could finish. In that scenario, so that's what happens in a typical real-time operating system and in a system which has task preemption. So where one task can interrupt another, which we'll look at later this week, um, in that scenario, we have challenges. And if we're going to start using this kind of approach to transfer data between tasks, we need to start introducing mechanisms such as semaphores, mutexes, other types of mechanisms to protect the data transfer between these tasks. So in a sense, in essence, we would have to put, before we wrote to that global variable in here, we'd have to start, we'd have to set a, a lock or some other mechanism that's to prevent this task from trying to access the data. The challenge otherwise would be, suppose that's an array of 100 elements. Suppose this uh, task has written to 50 elements. So it's written to half of the array. Then this task interrupts it and tries to process the data from the whole array. It could end up processing 50 new bits of data plus 50 bits of data that are, have not yet been updated. The combination could be a dangerous combination or meaningless uh, garbage or dangerous combination or whatever. So this comes up with the wrong result and then this comes back and it updates the array with the rest of the data, but by that stage it's too late. So we have to avoid that kind of problem. Uh, and we can do that with locking mechanisms. Just stick with that for one moment. Suppose this task has the job of processing the data from our data array. Suppose this task has written half the data to the data array and it's locked it. So it says the data is not yet complete, you can't process it. This task interrupts, what's going to happen? jump to A again. It's going to, so essentially this one's going to say, okay, task is, is locked, the data is locked, so I might as well terminate and let B uh, carry on. Very quickly, if you've got two or three different layers of tasks, or a typical system might have 50 tasks, trying to work out what the timing behavior is of that combination when different bits of data may be locked it's a practical impossibility. And that's one of the reasons why our starting point for these designs, in reality, not just in this course, but in reality, this is a near perfect architecture. You can't build every system with it, but our starting point for every single system we're asked to look at, no matter how complicated it is, first question we ask is, can we build it using this? And if you can, we build it using that because it's much, much simpler than any other option. Once you get down to this, it's almost impossible to work out what the timing behavior is. And we spend quite a lot of our time outside of these classes and things working with organizations who have code like this and want to turn it into something like that to try and make the behavior more predictable. The main implication for this for people is you can usually get it to work. It's difficult to work out the timing. And it, organizations with code structures like this tend to spend a huge amount of time testing. Because there's just an almost infinite number of possible combinations that can go on at runtime. A little bit of variation in the execution time of this before this interrupts can have a huge impact on whether that task can process the data or not. Would most real-time systems not be 
Um, in the kind of systems that you're going to be looking at, no. So in safety critical, uh, in the real world, you're going to be in the real world, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, high safety critical, safety related systems tend to be much closer to this. Not, in, not necessarily purely that. You can do this. You can do this, but if you do this in a time triggered way, then you can make it operate. The challenge really is if that happens at a time we don't know in advance. So if this one, if we don't, uh, so that happens here and we don't know what that time is, that's the real challenge. If we do know in advance what that time is, we can get around a lot of the problems, but that's going to take us another couple of modules to, to get to. For now, that's how this goes together. Yeah. Um, so we've got some private constants in here. We're setting up the pulse counting uh, in this design, uh, just doing some initialization of variables. Uh, we're checking whether uh, data is, is below threshold or not in this design, again, with periodic tasks. Uh, we're doing a complicated check here to determine whether uh, a particular pulse has happened or not. I'm not sure I do this exactly the same way again, but the way this is checking is it's checking historically uh, whether it's had a high level signal, a high level signal, followed by a low level signal, or another low level signal. And if it's had that sequence, it assumes it's had a correct falling edge on the pulse, and that's what it's looking for. So it's storing the values and checking for falling edges in that way. There are different ways of doing that. I'm not sure I'd do that again. Uh, so then it's checking for uh, a threshold number of um, falling edges it's dictated and it's updating the split display correspondingly. So the actual link to the periodic bar graph update in this design uh, happens from within the pulse count update function. So we've got two tasks running, but we're effectively just calling one task from the other task. That's a slightly unusual structure. In most cases, what you would expect to see most cases you would see uh, in here, you'd expect to see some kind of arrangement where the, uh, all of the periodic tasks are called actually from the operating system. And that's what you'll see in most of the examples that we look at. I think that's probably all I want to say about this. So, what we have here is, as we said, a time trigger cooperative uh, scheduling architecture. Uh, and we've talked through some of these things. Um, it avoids some of the problems uh, over the links between different tasks. And that's a problem that's called shared resources. Uh, so sometimes if different tasks, if multiple tasks in your system need access to an analog to digital converter, that can cause uh, challenges and fighting over that resource. Sometimes you can avoid that, but you can't generally create systems where the tasks are completely independent. The tasks almost always need to communicate and transfer data between them. That gives you a shared resource. That makes life uh, more complicated. Uh, working with these kind of designs allows you to set the system up so you've got a, the workload is distributed at design time, which makes it easier to predict how the uh, uh, system is going to operate. Uh, the alternative to this is to create systems with multiple interrupts, and we'll look over the next few days at some of the challenges that causes. So this, is, in summary, is the overall uh, advantage that we're trying to achieve here. These are time-triggered architectures. Uh, and our overall advantage is we're trying to be able to determine at runtime exactly what the system is going to be doing at every moment of time during which it's executing. And that's our overall uh, goal with these designs. Uh, and the challenge with this is one interrupt source per CPU. Uh, interrupt is sometimes, not always, a timer tick. 
and all the other peripherals, uh, the process is known as polling. The other peripherals are not connected, so your analog digital converter wouldn't be connected to another interrupt source. It would be polled, which means you would typically periodically check the flag from those peripherals, check the flag periodically to see whether the analog to digital converter had data ready to load, etc. This is how you would operate in these circumstances. Uh, and we've touched on the fact that the biggest challenge here is as long as the execution time is less than the tick interval, everything is fine. If the execution time exceeds the tick interval, we may have more challenges in this kind of environment. Okay, I've been talking for just over an hour. We'll take a pause at this point, uh, grab a coffee, tea, or loo break, and then we'll come back and look at multi state systems. Okay. Uh, there are two key parts. You can build a huge number of embedded systems knowing just two things. How to produce systems which run uh, driven by periodic timer ticks, 1 millisecond, 10 milliseconds, 25 milliseconds, etc. Uh, I was asked over coffee, how do you know whether it should be 1 millisecond, 10 milliseconds, or 25 milliseconds? The answer is come back and do A2, uh, which we do in you know, two or three months' time. Uh, there, we go through all of this again, but we give you a bit more maths, et cetera, to cover the details as to how you determine some of these parameters. We won't be doing that uh, this week. Uh, that's the first thing. Second thing is, how do you create systems with multiple states? Uh, and you looked at an example yesterday, which in reality, it was a system that had multiple states. And you had transitions between those states and the transitions between those states depended on certain inputs from the environment. And that's a very typical scenario. Look at a couple of examples. Uh, that's the simplest, traffic lights. Uh, and again, at the simplest possible level with that, we have a system that starts out in one state after a certain period of time, goes into another state, after a certain period of time, goes into another state, and so on. It's pretty dumb. But then you might have pedestrian crossings involved in that process. So there's a passage of time, and there's also inputs from the environment. There might be traffic levels. There might be sensors for the amount of traffic on the road that all feed into the system. And quite quickly, it becomes quite a complicated setup. But these guys are much more interesting than they look. Lots of quite complicated uh, processing going on in there. Uh, autopilot systems, again, another level up in terms of complexity, but the overall design is the same. We need to be able to produce systems which have uh, multiple states. We need to think about how, what the transitions are between those states, what triggers a transition between those states, and we need to be able to code up the result. So quite often, when you start the design of um, an embedded system, the first thing you'll do is sketch in some form what the different states are. And you'll draw a um, state transition diagram, something that looks a bit like a flowchart that basically lists the different states, and you start drawing arrows to indicate what can drive you between those states, and that's half of the design in many cases for a simple embedded application. Uh, so there are different ways of putting these systems together. The simplest, we have time-dependent multi-state systems. So your basic traffic light control system just driven by the passage of time. This is much more common. Time and input dependent. Multi-state systems, your washing machine, numerous other applications where there are inputs from the environment as well as the passage of time and that drives the way the system executes. Um, fully input dependent multi-state systems where there's no concept of the passage of time that's unusual, but possible. So it's just, if we've had this set of inputs, then go into this state. Almost always there's some kind of concept of a timeout behavior or something built into that, but that's a possibility, uh, that kind of design. So the most common is the one in red, time and input dependent multi-state systems. And we're going to look uh, in a few minutes at how we can put that kind of system together. Let's start with a simple, uh, time-dependent 
four state system running traffic lights uh, in the local model here. So we're going to have the traffic lights in red for 20 seconds, red and amber for 5 seconds, green for 30 seconds, amber for 5 seconds, no inputs to the system in this form. How are we going to do it? That's our main function. Uh, traffic lights in it, uh, initialized, they start life in the red state. We have a timer tick set up uh, uh, for 50 milliseconds. We go into our super loop and go to sleep. And this is how we get the system to work. So this is the header file for the traffic lights module. And we have an enumerated type here. What's that? Bit like an array, yep. Can you use words instead of numbers? Okay. Um, give me that at a higher level. So it's a user defined type or an approximation of a user defined type in C. So this is now, I can now create variables of type E light state. And in the examples that I use, you've got the prefix lowercase e to indicate that it's an enumerated type. Uh, so this is a type, and variables of this type can have the values red, red and amber, green or amber. Though we'll, these are not strings. So you won't say variable of this type equals uh, quotation marks red, close quotation marks. They're not strings. In fact, they're stored internally as integers, and the system isn't terribly powerful. You can often assign, depending on the compiler, you can assign any integer value typically to a variable that's an enumerated type in most C compilers. So it's not particularly strong, but it is useful. If we go back to this, that's an example of how we're assigning a value here. Uh, and it's pretty clear. Without knowing anything about enumerated types, we know what state the system starts in, and that's why it's useful. Uh, so that's taken on one of the possible values here. We can use this in a function header. So we're passing a variable that's const of e light state to the traffic lights init function, and that's what we did in the first page. And then we've got a traffic lights update function. Um, these, this is the traffic light module itself. So we're setting the durations in each of the states uh, there, the durations in seconds in each of the states. Um, these, are, these are private variables used only within this module, so they have the static keyword in front. And the main thing at the heart of this is we're storing light state G in a global variable of type E uh, light state. And this is the core of the way the program operates. So this is going to be called periodically. So we're going to set this up and we use, use the operating system to call this once a second. We, um, depending on the light state, assum assuming it's in red state, we do the following. Every time. We call it once a second. We turn on the red light, turn off the amber light, turn off the green light. We know that's happening. The logic of how that's uh, determined, we don't care about. It's clear. And then we do this. Plus, plus, time in state. So we increment the time in state, and we check until it gets to red duration. In this case, I think it was 20 seconds. Uh, then we change the state to red and amber. Uh, and we reset the time in state variable to zero. And then we break, if you look through the end of this, that's going to be the end of the, the end of the switch statement is the end of the function. So nothing else is going to happen here. We go back to where we were. So we were in the red state. We've been in there for 20 seconds. We're now in red and amber state. We've set the time in state to zero. Next time we call this function, we're in red and amber state. 
and the process goes on. Again, estimated execution time is close to zero. We're not delaying, we're not doing anything, we're just setting uh, a few uh, port pins to values of uh, on or off, uh, incrementing a variable and jumping through uh, the rest of the program. And that's it. And you can build a vast range of systems just based on that kind of logic. With the use of a switch statement, which some of you used yesterday in the solution to yesterday's exercise, just through the use of a switch statement, uh, and in most cases, for clarity of the code, uh, um, an enumerated type to store the possible system states for the system that we're in. It's not complicated. Combined with periodic ticks, it's very powerful. Uh, and you've, you've driven a car that's got any kind of electronic system in it, that's the bulk of what's going on uh, in the vehicle. It's based on something very similar to this. Quite often, the number of possible system states gets pretty long. You can end up with a 30-page plus switch statement in here. It gets difficult to handle at uh, these kind of levels, but that's essentially how the different possible system states are recorded. So you'd start the design for these kind of systems by beginning to think, okay, what are the states I need to have in my system? There is no concept of an interrupt here, is it? There is. It, the it's not, it's, it's basically, so we're assuming here, I've not shown it to you because it's exactly the same as before. Uh, if you look in the embedded C book, you'll find all of the code. Uh, so this is basically called once a second. So we're assuming we've got the uh, operating system or something calling this, the scheduler or operating system calling this function once a second. So we could just directly, if we had an appropriate processor, we could ho just hook this onto a timer and call this directly once a second, and that would, that's what we would require. Let's take it one step further. Our washing machine, long promised. So here, we have a number of different states to consider. An initialization state, a start state, a process of filling the drum, heating the water, etc., all need to be carried out in this system. Uh, it's an example of a time and input dependent uh, application. And in this case, we're going to assume that the machine also has the option of a number of different possible uh, wash programs that we can run and we'll just look at how we can incorporate that as well into this system. So we start by thinking about the possible system states. So in this case, we have decided that these are the possible states, including an error state, uh, which are going to be used in this system. We've got a lot more function prototypes because there's a lot more that can go on in this system. The key thing is, what are the possible states the system can have? Throughout this, what's controlling it is the possible uh, system state global variable. And these are the different programs. This is how we're representing the different programs here. We're simply saying that 10 different programs are supported each one may or may not use detergent in this example, or each one may or may not use hot water. So we've got a very simple way of recording for each of the 10 program options, whether hot water or detergent or any other number of factors you want to add in are used in these programs. Our initialization function for the washer uh, uh, just sets the processor, sets the system into a knit and a knit state. Uh, so we again have a switch statement based on the uh, current system state. In this design, we report the current system state and, and report that onto a debug port so that you can see what's happening uh, in the simulator in this case. In the initial state, we do some sensible things, put the motor off, the pump off, the water heater off, the water valves off in the system, and then we wait until the system reads that the start switch has been pressed. 
So there'll be another task we assume in the background here, which is periodically checking the uh, water, uh, the start switch on the processor. And until that's pressed, we just sit here forever in the initialization state. So it's just powered on, it's sitting there, whatever LEDs are on, and it's waiting for us to do something. Um, otherwise, so in this case, we're just returning if it's not equal to one. Otherwise, we're putting the system into start state. We get it into start state, which is up here. Uh, and we uh, lock the door, put the water valve on, release the detergent if there's any, and we go into the fill drum state. There's only one more state I want to look at here, and this is the kind of uh, thing that becomes useful here. So in each case, we reset the time in state variable back to zero. Once we're in the fill drum state, what can go wrong? One of the things that can go wrong is that the drum simply doesn't fill up with water because the pipe is broken, the water supply has been switched off, etc., etc. So here, we store the maximum duration that it should take for the drum to fill up. And we check that. And if the time in state, so it sits here trying to fill up and basically checks the water level. If it's been here for too long, then um, the drum should have filled up by now. It hasn't, so we put the system into an error state. Otherwise, um, we uh, it's filled up in time. We start heating the water if that's appropriate in this design. We change state again, and we carry on through this process. So that's how the system is put together. The other states are in there. You've got all of the code on the CD, excuse me, for the back, in the back of the embedded C book, and you can look at how this goes together. But that's uh, representative of a more realistic design where there are multiple states and there are various rules for controlling the transition between states, um, some to do with the passage of time and some to do with various inputs that come in from uh, the user. And again, this is driven periodically. I don't know what the interval is on this one, but this is driven periodically by timer ticks is what's updating uh, this operation. And all of the tasks here are just dummy tasks. All of the operations are just dummy operations in this set. So two final things I want to just look at this morning. The first is be to begin to think about one key issue. We've talked about the fact that we're putting together systems which look something like this. And we said there are a number of advantages in creating designs where the systems are time triggered uh, and the tasks don't interrupt one another. But to make that work, we've got to be able to guarantee that the task will complete within the tick interval. And we said, OK, we need to determine what the tick interval is. But whatever it is, we've got to make sure that the task completes within the tick interval. It's quite easy to think up applications for which that rule can be broken. Uh, so you've got two options at that stage. If you need to run that set of tasks and that set of tasks, on a system with a TTC architecture, what's going to happen? So that's what I want to happen. What will happen? The tick will basically interrupt the load along the task will be interrupted. It's a, so in this design, we're assuming it's cooperative. So tasks cannot interrupt one another. So we've only got one CPU. So what are you going to see? Okay, so if you're lucky, it'll do A, then it'll do B, and then it'll catch up on the missing A's. If you're not lucky, what will probably happen is you'll lose the missing A's. They'll simply be ignored because the processor's not ready, and we'll look at some ways of dealing with that scenario tomorrow. But whatever happens, you can't have these two uh, systems running 
Uh, you can't run more than one task simultaneously. And unless you start supporting task preemption and allow one task to interrupt another, you're not going to be able to get close to what you want to do here. So we've got two options in these circumstances. We can either change the scheduling approach and allow one task to interrupt one another, or sometimes we can restructure the tasks cleanly to make them do the job we want to do. And the question is whether you can restructure the tasks cleanly to match this architecture or not. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. I'll give you an example of one uh, problem area and one solution to that. Suppose you're used to using printf statements in C to display information on the screen. If that's your target board, you don't have um, a screen, typically. Uh, so if we wanted to use printf statements here, what quite commonly happens is you use an RS-232 connection and use something like a laptop to display the information. You might use that for debugging. It's obviously not going to be there all the time, but you might use that for debugging or for other ways in your application. Uh, if you do this, let's assume we're going to use RS-232, an RS-232 protocol to send these data, and assume we're going to use 9600 baud as our uh, bit rate. Again, it's standard, not particularly fast, but it's a standard baud rate. It'll take about 42 milliseconds to send these data. There are 42 characters up there, 9600 baud, uh, 10 bits per character, uh, including the start and stop bits. It will take us approximately 42 milliseconds to send these data. If I'm going to stick that line in here, I'm in difficulty, probably. There are two problems with that function call as it stands if we're going to send the data from here to here in, in one fell swoop. First problem is that it may take a long time. Second problem is that execution time is not bounded. So I could decide today, suppose it didn't work properly. Suppose I had a 10 millisecond tick here, and I just tried to send these, this data string. What's quite likely to happen, if I don't understand what's going on, is I'll add a few more printf statements to debug the application. I've seen it happen many times. Uh, it's frightening. Um, but I'll add some more printf statements, which will, of course, make the situation worse. The basic problem with this is it's unbounded. I could send any amount of data, and as soon as I do that, the duration of the task is going to vary in a manner that is impossible to generally predict. Um, we could work it out from the size of the string, but I could just keep adding additional bits to the application, and it would be problematic. How do we solve it? We can't do that. can't send the data directly to here. Suppose we do this. Copy all the data to a character array. So just to an array in memory. So rather than sending the data directly to here, we copy the data to an array in memory. And then we do one more step. We set up a periodic task that takes one character from that array and copies it to the, over the RS-232 link to the PC. We've turned this then if we do that, then we've turned this from a task that would probably not be called very often and would take quite a long time into a task which is probably called every millisecond or 10 milliseconds. So it's called quite frequently, but will now take a short period of time, probably a very short period of time. The time taken to do that is probably pretty close to immeasurably short. Just copying the data into an array in memory will take very little time. How long will this take? Um, let's assume we're using 9600 baud, sending one character at a time, and we're, sending, we're doing the update every 10 milliseconds. How long will it take to actually, um, how long will the task take 
that takes the data from there and sends it over the RS-232 link. No, no, that's exactly the point. Almost no time. Because what it takes a second, because what you have to do is you copy the data to be sent to the hardware buffer in the hardware UART, and then it sends the data. Now, if you're going to send a whole string of data, you have to wait while the UART sends the character. And then when it's sent that character, you give it another one, and it sends that one. You wait for it, you take another one. So it takes you 42 milliseconds. But in fact, it takes 0.96 milliseconds to send each character of 9600 bot. Well, let's, let's just assume the 10 milliseconds, for example. But if we send it every 10 milliseconds, we send one character, will, there be, will the buffer be free next time we try and send a character? Yes. One character at a time takes less than a millisecond to send it, character will have been sent and the hardware buffer will be free. Assuming nothing else is fighting for that, takes one millisecond to send it, we're only asking it to send one character every 10 milliseconds, so by the time we go back and say, can you send this next character, we don't have to wait, we know that the buffer will be free. So the time taken to actually copy the character from here into the hardware buffer of the UART is almost infinitesimally small. So we've taken our task which if we did this would take 42 milliseconds. Now doing this takes next to no time. Doing this takes next to no time. And we've solved the problem without, as long as we do this frequently enough, the user won't notice anything at all. The display will just be updated or whatever is going on. But the software load, as far as our application is concerned, has disappeared completely. And we haven't needed to um, use preemption in the system. So in this case, not in all cases, but in this case, there is what I would argue, once you've done that once, doing it any other way feels very silly. If you haven't done it before, this may look complicated. Once you've done it once, this just becomes a natural way of doing this. And it doesn't just work for these communications, it works for lots of different data transfer, displays, updates, and everything else. The overall architecture um, is the same. And once you've done it once, it's straightforward. Sometimes your UART will take 16 bytes at a time in hardware. And you just and so you've got very you can actually send these data, you can take 16 byte blocks of this and send it automatically in the hardware, and the data transfer rates are really fast, and there's very little load still in doing that. Um, but the approach is straightforward and it's a natural fit, and you can produce the system cleanly in that way without breaking the way that you think about the software. And that's important. Because there's no point in saying this is a great architecture if we have to really change the way we design the software in order to use that architecture. So in some cases, there are techniques we can use which allow us to match these high reliability requirements without breaking the way that we're doing the software today. And that's one example of a design pattern uh, which we can use for some of these systems. We, uh, one of the modules that those of you who are doing the MSC program will do, one of the modules on the MSC program is on design patterns. We'll look at some design patterns that we've created, but the main focus of that module will be that you will focus on creating uh, more patterns of your own by the end of the module. And that's, we did that a, few, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and that was a successful module. Uh, underlying this, there are some material in your notes about RS-232. I'm not going to say very much about these. I've left these in here so that you can read up on this if you're not familiar with it. Very briefly, uh, old standard, still popular, uh, can be used at up to 330 or so kilobits per second, but most people don't use it anywhere near that speed. It's typically used um, for debug and control of embedded systems, linking them to laptops or other devices. These days, you will probably need a USB to serial converter plugged into the back of your laptop to allow you to use these kind of protocols, but these things are available. Uh, what application code would you use on the PC or the laptop to talk to this? Hyperterminal. 
hyperterminal, something like that is the common way of doing this. So you would typically see things in hyperterminal on your Windows PC or other um, things on Linux, etc. Um, still used for testing, debugging, data application, uh, uh, data acquisition. You can use USB for many of these things, and some microcontrollers have this. It's much more complicated. Uh, and typically adds cost, etc., to your application that you don't have with these simpler solutions. Um, these are some of the basics of uh, this, which I'm not going to do in any detail, uh, which are there really for reference. And this is how it links in to the 8051 microcontroller. You've got one thing which is worth mentioning on the way through this. On the 8051, but not on more modern devices, to get 9600 baud, you can't use, yesterday we assumed a 12 megahertz crystal in the system, which gives you a simple way, uh, typically, of obtaining one millisecond ticks or other kind of ticks in your system. If you want 9600 baud or other standard baud rates, on the 8051, you need to use 11.0592 megahertz or other multiples of that to obtain those baud rates. You can't get a one millisecond tick on a system which, not a precise one millisecond tick on a system using these baud rates, you can get a five millisecond tick, or 10 or 15 or so. So sometimes you'll see in the RS-232 examples that a five millisecond tick has been used, and that's one of the reasons why uh, it's been done there. These are how you can calculate the values, and this tells you um, uh, some of the differences in the baud rate you'll get at different crystal frequencies. Uh, there are a couple of examples in here which uh, you may find it worth looking at. The first one displays time uh, on hyperterminal or similar from a device hooked onto a serial interface. I'm not going to talk about that one. I'll leave you to review that. The structure is the same as before. I'm going to just talk briefly about this one, which is more useful. Um, what this second example does on page 102 in your notes is this is more representative of the kind of thing that you sometimes do over a serial interface. So this gives you a basic set of menu choices on the laptop or whatever, allowing you to read port 1 or port 2 and display the values back on the PC. It's a very simple change to use that to control the values on the ports as well as reading them. And by the time you can do that, you've got quite a lot of control over your application. So you've got the framework in there. I'm not going to do the details of this. Have a look through the framework and ask any questions you may have about this. This runs in the simulator quite happily. I don't think there's anything I want to say about this one. Final thing I want to say for this morning is about MISRA C. We're going to give you a copy of the MISRA C guidelines, but I've forgotten to bring them with me, so I'll bring them in uh, later this afternoon. Uh, MISRA C. We talked yesterday about some of the challenges involved in creating reliable systems using C code, and we talked about some of the problems that arise uh, for example, because of type checking in C, because of array bounds checking in C, etc. Uh, in the automotive world, where embedded processors are increasingly used, they made a decision. That's the C language uh, in a Venn diagram form. That's Misra C. It's a subset. I know it's typically called a safe subset of C. What Misra C amounts to is how many? 141 guidelines in total by now, which basically define how they suggest you use the C programming language in systems which are safety related or safety critical. Began life in the automotive sector. We'll give you a printed set of the guidelines, a complete set of the guidelines this afternoon. Uh, these were basically uh, designed to get around, it, they're a sort of 
pragmatic, rational approach to the world. People are using C. There may be better languages, but if people are going to use C, can we help them to use C in an appropriate way? And that's what this standard tries to do. Uh, I'm aware of organizations uh, uh, in a range of different sectors that are using this, including aerospace. So some of the work in aerospace, traditionally that was an ADA domain, some of the work in aerospace is, is in C these days, particularly stuff that's US related. Uh, and in that domain, people are using MISRA C as guidelines uh, yeah, for creating these kind of systems. Uh, useful to have on your CV these days. Uh, to do this, you're going to need some way. There are lots of different tools that will check your MISRA C compliance. As you'll see, the book is fairly chunky, and you're not going to want to do these things manually. You'll need some way of doing checks for MISRA C compliance. We're going to give you a simple tool. I'm not trying to sell you tool sets. We don't sell a MISRA C tool checker. Um, we'll give you a simple MISRA C tool. It's on an education license. That's not because we don't want to give it to you. That's because we don't want you using it in real systems and coming back and telling us uh, you know, there are problems. It wasn't created for those purposes. It was created to illustrate some of the basic rule checking. Uh, so we give you a set of this to play with, to give you a feel for how these things work. There are lots of different ways of doing MISRA C checking. Uh, these are some of the rules that are checked with uh, MISRA C, the MISRA C checker. I just want to highlight one or two of these. We're going to ask you to think about some of these rules in an exercise this afternoon, but I want to highlight a couple of them. Should I get this right? What does that mean? In C. It's known as a trigraph. And one of the Misra C rules is that 4.2 trigraphs shall not be used. What does that mean? It means curly brackets, if I've got it the right way around, right? yep. And what, uh, yep, and I think it's bang, bang, yep, bang, bang, and one parenthesis means square brackets. Why? What does the trigraph do? Sorry? I don't know the function. Okay, essentially, you write that, that's what the, uh, that's how it's interpreted in C. You write that, and that's a single curly parenthesis, that's a single curve parenthesis bracket, uh, and that's how it's interpreted in C. Um, why do you think it might have, the world might have been created that way? When was the language, when did the language originate? 1970s. Your keyboard may not have had that. So that was provided to get around that gap. What happened now, your keyboard will have that, but you might inadvertently stick that set in a debug thing, not entirely sure what's going on here, question mark, question mark, is it a blah, 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 and what's actually seen by the compiler is this, and you're going to have no idea what on earth is going on. Um, because most of you can't work out why you would even want to do that. So the rule is, if you put that into your, into your C program and you run a MISRA C check, the, the tool set will come back and say, no, don't do it. Um, so that's one of them. Um, it has various rules on the comments. Um, let me see. Right, this is another one that I want to highlight for you. X equal to 100, yep. I say, okay, Y is equal to 10, uh, whatever, I don't care really what Z is. 
Uh, now that looks a bit untidy. That's, that's tidy. What's the value of y? What's the value of x? Why is it not 10? Which means it's octal. So now uh, y is base 8. Because that, so you're happy with that. That says base 16. And you're comfortable with that. That doesn't look too much of a problem because that's not very confusing. And typically when it's followed by something like that, again, you, you don't have any great difficulty with it. So that's fine. The problem is this. Um, this is more problematic because that can be very confusing. In fact, when you write every time, um, that's... 0, base 8, but you don't care because uh, it doesn't matter. But still, technically, that's what it is. Uh, here, you do care because it's not 10, it's 8. Uh, so octal constants other than 0 shall not be used. And again, if you write this in and you check this with Mizra C, it'll pick up these things. So essentially, that's just a flavor of some of the things that go on. There are 141 of these, and I'm not going to pretend that I'll go through uh, each of them. Uh, we'll give you a copy of this. We would be giving you a copy now if I hadn't left it in the car. Uh, we'll give you a copy of the 2004, the latest set of Misery C guidelines, so you can see where that comes from. And we'll give you a simple set of checking tools to uh, give you a feel for what this can do. But this is uh, the intention here is to try and improve the um, reliability of programs or systems which are based on C. Is that, is that going to become like a standard? Or is it already a standard? It's effectively a, it's effectively a standard. Uh, the, as much as many of these things are. So Misra C is maintained by an independent body of experts. It's not a commercial organization. It's an independent body with representatives from a range of different organizations who get together periodically, roughly every decade, and update the standard. Um, so, uh, and then people create tools that match up to what the um, sets are in the book. So it's essentially, it's been pretty successful. Um, so I said, Ada is a better language. Not to be outdone, Those of you that are going on to do some work in Ada won't be working in Ada. You'll be working with Spark, a safe subset of Ada. So Ada's gone through this process too. So even Ada, which is in many, without a doubt, better, def more clearly defined. One of the problems with C is there are parts of the language which are not fully defined, and that makes it impossible. Uh, Ada's much better. A few would argue it's just you can't get programmers generally to do it. Spark is a subset of Ada, and the nice thing about the Spark subset is that the properties of the language in Spark are mathematically verifiable. And that is quite powerful. Then you can start using some formal proofs to show that this specification of what the system should do is actually matched by the implementation you've chosen. And that's taking us into some interesting new domains. Uh, and there's quite a lot of interest in the, in the implications for using that kind of approach. It, it's, uh, there are some approximations of that in C, but the language isn't sufficiently well defined, so it's still allow you to do that. So that, that's where we are for this morning. Um, what we're, so we've covered quite a lot of ground again. What we're going to ask you to do is to explore some of these things in the uh, exercise that follows here.